Great. Excellent. OK, so we have one last future briefing and then you can listen to myself and the hosts uh, and the other co-hosts sum up and hopefully we'll open the gates for you to uh, join us for a bit of serendipity and networking and maybe a beer. But before that, we have our double sponsor of the day, Fastly. We're going to be talking about the CDN perspective of Edge Compute. Let's find out what the differences are. Sean, are you out there? Hello. Good to see you. Hey, Sean, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm all right. I'm slightly at the edge, end of a very long eight hours, but I'm, my brain <laughs> is swollen at the moment. So I'm just... I can't to... tell. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, can you just, before we go into uh, the Edge Compute session, tell us a little bit about Fastly because uh, you are a key sponsor today and I want to make sure that everyone who's listening knows all about you. Yeah, sure. Um, my name's Sean. Like, like I said, I'm the Chief Product Architect here at Fastly and Fastly was founded a little over 10 years ago. At, to really redefine um, and give our customers a lot of power and take advantage of the edge. Uh, we had seen our, our founders were uh, builders of big web applications and websites, and they were, you know, they were not, uh, not happy with the solutions that were out there for them. So they did as any sane person does and decided to go out and build it themselves to solve their problems. And uh, we were really seen as kind of a, a next generation CDN when we first launched, we, allowed our customers to extend their applications out to the edge because they they wanted to take advantage of the edge, but there weren't really any solutions back then where they could take advantage of it. And so um, we were really popular early on with some of the more forward thinking customers, you know, the GitHubs of the world, the Etsy's, et cetera. And um, we, 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 we were very fortunate to have built this platform in such a way that we could start to build other products on top of it as well. So like I said, CDN was the first product that we had um, and, and had a lot of uh, early and you know successes up till now, as well as some other technologies around um, you know low latency video. We have performance solutions, and then we recently acquired a company called Signal Sciences, which is uh, like the market leading web application and API security company out there uh, to really expand our security solutions as well. So um, yeah, we're very fortunate to have great customers that seem to like us. I wouldn't say you came out of nowhere, but you certainly came out of wherever you came from very quickly and exploded onto the scene. It's been a, a welcome entry to the sector. Yeah, we, it, we've been very fortunate and uh, we're just very fortunate we have such great customers who uh, have built some really cool things on top of us, which has really driven our product roadmap over the years. It's a great way to look at it. I, I, was, I was going to compliment the team, but uh, I'll compliment the <laughs> yeah, yeah, give them all the credit. Okay, let's focus in on uh, on edge computing. and. Uh, so we've, we've, we've looked at the network view with Verizon and we've looked at the cloud view and in rather an unusual setup with, uh, with Baishan, uh, an extremely large market out in China and so on. For the CDN perspective of edge compute, now I, you know, I mentioned it earlier, I always think of this, the CDN as one of the pioneering environments for edge computing and so on. But talk to us a little bit about what you think are some of the use cases that you're seeing with your customers as you build your uh, edge serverless product. Yeah, sure thing. I was very fortunate to build uh, build that with our amazing engineering team and launch that back in November of 2019, I think it was. And I think to see the use cases, it helps to understand what led us to build that as well. Is Like I said, we had a lot of customers who were doing some really great things on our edge using kind of the first generation of the platform that allowed them to do some really cool things around caching and routing and A-B testing and some of those things that, you know, that were very caching and routing specific um, out at the edge. And, but what they kept telling us was they wanted more power with the platform. They wanted um, like languages like that they knew, like the technologies that they were used to and had trained their team on as well. And they wanted to have all that power without a decrease in either safety or performance, right? Like we, we had these big edge deployments all over the world. We allowed you to do, make your site faster and we didn't want to decrease that by giving you more power, right? We didn't want to sacrifice the performance in any way or the safety, especially when you're running in a multi-tenant environment. So we built this platform with a lot of the things that they told us they wish they could do on us. And we're seeing some really cool use cases with like, content modification is a pretty big one out there. Like we have a lot of the streaming providers out there as customers of ours. And, you know, obviously manifest and manifest manipulation is a very a really popular thing in that space, but a lot of time it's done back at the kind of the core, the central area. They'd love to be able to do that on the edge. And so those are some pretty common use cases we have on top of us um, as like edge side ad insertion and like um, device uh, mo modifying the manifest to be able to target different devices and whatnot. 
Authentication fronting is another big one where you have, uh, you know, you put this, a lot of our customers put us in front of all of their applications and APIs. And so as the traffic comes in, they want to be able to do a very, like an authentication and authorization check before they let that traffic through to their, their different backends or applications, and whatnot. They're doing a lot of really cool things there. GraphQL has really exploded on the scene. Um, and previously GraphQL wasn't the easiest to do things with caching, right? You had to trans, you know, the, those requests had to go all the way back to the application. And what you'd really like to do is serve a lot of that content out at the edge, like a CDN was built for. So we see a lot of people doing GraphQL federation and caching on top of us. And then just some really cool stuff around security detection and enforcement. Like what we're seeing is people, it, we, we experienced this, experience this early on as, as, um, as a company where we're sitting in front of our customers' most valuable traffic, right? Like here's their applications and APIs, here's their customers, and we're sitting in front of all of that. And so we had to really convince them early on that they could trust a startup to sit in front of that, right. all of that traffic for them. Now, luckily they saw the value of us and they did it and, and you know, the rest is history. But what this, pro this platform has allowed us to do is give other startups the ability to build applications in that, in that kind of privileged position because they can't build out a massive CDN or a big you know, global reverse proxy network or anything like that. But we do give them build the ability to write really cool business logic on top of us. And we handle the scale, the replication, the security, all of that so that they can just kind of build business logic on us and build really cool new businesses and use cases. That's perfect. A virtuous cycle. That's excellent. So how do you differentiate from, say, AWS, Lambda, or other cloud providers of ser serverless? Yeah, I think we looked at this, the serverless kind of ecosystem out there. Like Lambda is a great product, but it's very focused on being close to your big data stores, right? So it runs in one location. You might be able to launch a Lambda function in a couple of locations, but you have to solve a lot of the distributed systems problems when it comes to distributing your application everywhere. It has slower startup times. Um, so if you're thinking about like the, the, the use cases we really wanted to focus on for the first launch of the product were low latency, high scale, like not batch jobs that need to like pull some data from a database, manipulate it and put it back into the database, but sitting in front of all of your traffic, sitting in the data plane, and responding in real time to millions and millions of requests per second, and then doing that globally. So if you look at what we've built, it runs in all of our many, many locations around the world. Like it, we, I think our capacity these days is like 130 terabits a second of capacity. Like we built the network for scale and speed and low latency. And so if you're gonna build something in that environment, you wanna use something like our platform where we don't have problems with cold start times. Like one of the challenges with a lot of serverless platforms is request comes in, you have to spin the thing up that can take five milliseconds to hundred milliseconds, run the code, and then the next request comes in. That can really cause a lot of latency and, and performance problems. Like I said, one of our design uh, requirements was no de decrease in performance. So the way we handle that is your application runs in all of our locations around the world. Request comes in, in 35 microseconds, we spin up a complete sandbox we run your code and then we destroy it. And then we do it again for you know, millions of requests per second as they come in. That just gives us tremendous power and performance that we expose to our customer. So if you have, I just gotta look at it as a, you need high scale, you need instant scale and you need low latency. We're just a perfect fit for those types of network applications. Perfect. So uh, uh, you've spoken about latency there, but what are the other benefits of tying serverless to competing at the edge? You know? What, 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 what makes the edge, in your opinion, the right choice? I mean, it, 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 you want to do, you know, when you're talking about things like personalization, you want to do that as close to the end user you're personalizing for as possible, right? Like if you've got a data center on the East Coast and a data center on the West Coast, no matter where they're coming from the rest of the world, you don't want to transit all of that traffic back there, personalize it, and then send it all the way back out, right? That's just too many milliseconds. What you want to be able to do is personalize that content as close to that end user as possible. So that could be a browser, it could be a mobile device, it could be an IoT device, it could be an attacker. And so you wanna be able to push that security enforcement out as close to that attacker as possible as well. So it makes the most sense to be able to push logic and data out as, I mean, we, this was proven early on for CDNs with pushing as much data 
out as close to the end users as possible. Now you can run logic on that data out as close to that end device, client, browser, whatever it is. And so we're really seeing a ton of benefit both on the performance side, but again, on that security side, if you're getting hit with a you know, terabit a second DDoS attack, you don't wanna backhaul all that traffic through the internet all the way back to your application. Like, A, the internet will probably have challenges <laughs> transiting all of that traffic. You wanna be able to block that traffic out as close to that attacker as possible and not you know, saturating the, 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 the network pipes on the way to your application. So when you're considering how to build out at the edge, what would you encourage developers and businesses to keep in mind? What are the kind of key things there? Yeah, I think that if you're, if you know, I've been asked this question before about like what things you shouldn't build on the edge, which, and I'll talk about that in a second, but like, if you look at like the, the, if you're talking about like old legacy databases, like let's say you've got this massive like Oracle database or something like that. A lot of those things can't be pushed out to the edge. And so those aren't always the, the best kind of like use cases if you're dependent on that very like centralized kind of data store. But then what we've seen with a lot of customers is if they do have that legacy system, they can push a lot of the functionality out. They may not be able to push all the functionality out. Sometimes you still have to go back to that central cloud or that data center, right? When you're talking about like, truly like dynamic content. But if there, there are quite a few things that you can push out to the edge, components of your application to, you know, cause sometimes it's the small wins, right? If it takes, you know, 300 milliseconds for your page to load normally, if you can push as much of that as possible out to the edge and not require that backhaul except for certain things, it really increases that, that speed and performance of your web application, your API, whatever it is. So I think cloud native, De, uh, design applications are much easier, right? They've already been broken down into microservices. They're, they've been kind of peeled apart. So it's really easy to move those components out to the edge. And a lot of times the data stores can easily be replicated out to the edge in real time as well. And that's when you get like the true power of the edge. But if you've got that legacy system, sometimes it just takes some work to, to move, you know, components outside the edge or out to the edge, but it's worth it for sure. And when thinking about the edge, it often seems like most workloads can be moved there, but does anything not fit into the world of the edge? Uh, you know, what, what if anything belongs at the core and we, we've spoken about databases there, but you know, what, what, what are the sort of uh, don't do's if you like? Yeah, it's a good question. Cause I was gonna, I was gonna talk about that at one point or at some point, I think, and I wrote a blog about this like last year, I think it was. And like, I really spent a lot of time talking to customers and talking to engineers. And what we found was, like I said, the big state issue like legacy databases like some of that just can't be moved to the edge like that's okay like a lot of times those aren't your most high traffic you know low latency high performance sites right but there are components of those things you can move out to the edge the other one is around machine learning where a lot of times the edge hasn't been designed to do the training of the models. Always what you usually will do is, you know, a lot of the computation power that are, you know, are dependent on big GPU farms and whatnot. Those are still best done at the core, like Google, AWS, Azure, all those folks have pretty amazing um, AI training systems. But once those models are generated, you can push the models out to the edge to run the models. That's a great place to, so train in the central cloud, run the models out at the edge, right? Against that, uh, that live traffic as it comes in. And then, you know, we see some things with some legacy protocols um, that, you know, the web has mostly won. It's, you know, it's, it's been, which is a good thing. It's a, it's a great, I mean, I'm a huge, huge fan of HTTP and now HTTP2 and Quick and uh, whatnot. Most of the big high scale applications these days are being built on the HTTP kind of protocol or one of the you know, new generations of it. Um, we're seeing some other like more legacy older protocols that still go back to the central cloud just because so much focus on scale and performance and, and edge has been on the HTTP side, which you know, for us, it's a ton of fun. <laughs> So I think I know the answer to the next question, but uh, but but I'm going to ask it anyway. So do you think this is just the beginning for edge compute and serverless at the edge? I think it's, it's interesting. I almost see those as two different things still, like edge and serverless. And in that, I think the edge is still a little bit of a, um, an unknown location sometimes, right? Like 
it, depending on who you talk to, the edge can go anywhere from a factory floor all the way out to, you know, like big exchange points around the internet. The way we define it is it's where the developer has really lost control in some ways, right? They don't like, they can't build the, you know, they, they can't control as much of the network pass out through that last mile down to the device and whatnot. And so the edge itself, you're going to continue to see a lot more technology and applications move out there, but there's a lot of problems that you, you have to solve out on the edge as well. If you don't use a, like a third party, right? You have to solve some of the distributed systems problems. You have to solve some of the deployment and the security problems, right? I remember talking to a few folks early on and they were like, they had bought like old like um, distribution centers and they wanted to be able to put compute gear in there. It was like, well, what's the security look like? on those, those centers and like, well, there's really not much. Well, I know a lot of the people I know if we want to move their compute out to the edge, they have some pretty strict security compliance requirements in terms of who has access to those facilities, the data and whatnot. So just moving all your code out to the edge doesn't solve all your problems because it introduces some new problems as well. So the edge, it's, a, it's an amazing new computing paradigm but I still think there's a lot of questions around in terms of where, like what's the best thing to, you know, depending on where the edge is, like we talk about it by moving as close to the last mile as possible. I don't see us anytime soon having things running in a factory floor in the middle of a farm, you know, out in the middle of the, you know, the country somewhere. That's just not our skill set and not something we want to focus on. There's a lot of other really smart people building tech and, and solutions for that where we're going to always be amazing at is really high scale, low latency applications with millions of users around the world, right? The, now on the serverless side, I'm definitely bullish on that as well because my perfect world is a developer only has to write business logic. They don't have to worry about anything below it, right? Think of the, think of the, like, the maturity over time of the things developers haven't had to focus on. They, have, they used to have to focus on like data centers and deploying gear and racks and power and backup generators and all that. They don't have to do that anymore. They used to have to worry about like pulling fiber or ethernet into the, into the rack. They don't have to worry about that anymore. They used to have to worry about buying a ton of servers and most developers don't have to worry about that anymore or managing the operating system. So like over time, the, what the developers had to focus on has shrunk to the point now where they can build some amazing applications on platform as a service or the, the hyper clouds or folks like us. And so my perfect world is everything is serverless and all you're doing is writing business logic. I'm a developer. I have a brilliant idea. Well, I don't, but like all of you do, like I want to just write code and deploy it on this magical system that auto scales and runs it everywhere and handles all of the compute problems for me. So that's where I, I would love to see serverless continue to go to the point where that kind of like vision is realized. That's perfect. And so how do you imagine this all going forward? And, you know, do you think it's important for people to start building at the edge today? And why? <laughs> the only way we can, tr I mean, we saw this early on with, with our CDN, which was we built this cool tech. We weren't sure how people were going to use it. And they built amazing things on top of it. So, and then that pushed us to work harder and build cooler tech, right? It's just a nice little continuous cycle. Put something out there, people build cool stuff, they break it, they make it better, and they, you know, they check, they push it to the limits, and then you build cooler stuff on top of that. I think that's what I'm really the most excited to see is, is there's a lot of great companies, you know, a couple that were just on before me and throughout the rest of the day that are starting to build out really great tech and on the edge and in serverless. It's just going to make all of us work harder. I know I work harder when I see some of our competition putting some cool stuff out. I'm like, that's really neat. So that helps drive us to build even cooler stuff and, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. So I've got a, I've got a, sort of a, a personal question. So, you know, I, I asked Ben this, you know, what, what, what sort of skills do you think that uh, developers should be focusing on? We're, we're my, my own company, Adrian spoke a bit, bit about it earlier. We're very much an Erlang house. Uh, serverless compute isn't there yet for Erlang. Erlang, we kind of typically work with infrastructure as a service environments and so on. We're, we're probably a bit orthogonal. We're very focused on a specific live streaming use case, but what are the types of skills that you think that people should be acquiring to get out onto the edge and what, what type of infrastructures are, are going to be becoming available? Um, what sort of serverless compute environments are going to be becoming available? 
Yeah, so I think for us, we put we put a lot of our future on WebAssembly and the WebAssembly systems interface. And why we loved that so much was, you know, we we built the te- uh, this technology ourselves. We didn't, you know, like pull you know technology out of a browser or whatever and use as the kind of the virtualization platform. I've seen that um, out there done quite a bit. We said to build truly scalable applications that can run everywhere in real time with like super low latency. We had to kind of develop it using a technology that was focused on that level of performance. And so what WebAssembly allows us and the work that we've been doing in which we open sourced on the WebAssembly systems interface side is it allows you to use any any languages that conform to that specification, like kind of like how POSIX is for the Unix systems calls. And so that allows developers to use the languages that they're used to. They don't have to learn new skills. We want to allow them to use Rust or Go or JavaScript or Erlang, right? With any kind of a JVM based language, you know, with Scala or one of those, like that's what we'd love to see customers not have to worry about all the things below that layer and just write cool code and cool, cool logic. Now, if you've got some legacy apps that you just want to move out to the edge, there's a lot of interesting tech out there with containers at the edge using like Firecracker or some people are using Docker. Um, that makes it t- kind of nice too, where you don't have to learn so much new technology. Cause that's like, like I said, that's my vision. I would love it if people could just write cool business logic and not worry about all that stuff below it as yeah. best as possible. <laughs> And you just absolutely vindicated some of the stuff I said in the welcoming notes about what the CDNs should be offering. Sean, I'd like to thank Fastly and you for both sponsoring and for giving us a great presentation and supplying Jim earlier on for the uh, for the video workflow panel as well. It's been a, a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.